How many times have you heard the phrase, life is not fair? <laughs> How many times have you said it yourself? Who said it in here? Somebody said it? Yep, me too, guilty as charged. And you know what? You're right. You are all right. Life is not fair, actually. And it's easy to look around and see what other people have that you don't. And in fact, the more you look, the more you see that other people have that you don't. So no, life is not fair. But I believe that this is a good thing because all of these differences are part of what I like to call our toolkits. Each person's set of unique attributes and choices and circumstances that positions them to connect with others in this world that either need the toolkits that they have or share commonality with them because they have the same tools themselves. Your toolkit may not look like you expected it to or like you wish it did, but it's necessary that life is not fair for you to be able to use your toolkit to its maximum potential. Let me tell you how. My daughter Darcy is four years old now, but when she was 16 months old, she was diagnosed with moderate to severe hearing loss, otherwise known as deafness. Now this is the kind of thing that you can compensate fairly well for when you're young, and it sort of doesn't become obvious until you start to get older, but it's a lot more debilitating than it looks on the outside. She started to make consistent noises for objects, so kind of words in her context, at about eight months old, pretty early. But those words were just not getting any clearer over time. And that didn't make sense to me because my daughter is a very extroverted person. She's very engaged in her environment. And I knew that she had exposure to these words on the regular. And so we watched expectantly and hoped that things would just kind of clear up on their own, and they didn't. And so my husband and I eventually took her to our amazing children's hospital here in Philadelphia, where we got a diagnosis of hearing loss and she was fit for hearing aids. And at first, with aggressive therapy and follow-up, she did very well. Her speech started to improve fairly quickly. But over time, she started to complain that the hearing aids just weren't working anymore. And we watched a fairly rapid decline to severe hearing loss at all audio frequencies. And then finally, in the fall of 2018, we started to notice a very significant behavior shift in my daughter, both at school and at home. And so with urgent follow-up, we confirmed what we suspected, that both of her ears had declined to complete and profound hearing loss, and she had zero access to sound at all. So we jumped headfirst into the cochlear implant process, and she was implanted in January of 2019. And if you've never been around someone with cochlear implants, you might just assume that they're high-tech hearing aids, but that's actually not the case at all. What a person with cochlear implants hears is essentially electrical impulses that the brain has to then translate somehow into a speech sound and then translate the person's own speech sound to something appropriate that they can then respond to their environment. It's immensely complicated and nobody really knows exactly how that works in the brain. But fortunately, she was able to adapt fairly quickly, um, and she works very hard with her teachers of the deaf and her speech therapists and her audiologists and all of our specialists to move forward through the rehab process. It'll be a lifelong journey, um, and I'm sure we don't give her enough credit for how much work it takes for her to be functional, um, and the world doesn't either, but I'm definitely grateful for the progress that we've made this far. That being said, when Darcy was diagnosed as being deaf, I was devastated at first. I mourned all of the things that I thought she would miss. As an avid musician by training, I just the thought of her not being able to experience the richness of music just crushed me. And I mourned all of the laughter and the sounds of nature and the whispers that she would never hear. And I knew that the hearing technology would help bridge the gap somewhat, but I also knew that the auditory input that she would have would never be the same as it would be if she didn't have hearing loss. What I didn't anticipate, though, was how well her other senses were able to compensate for that and even adjust over time. Now, as a pharmacist, I biologically knew that this was a possible process, but it was totally different to watch it in action and watch my daughter's compensation help her interact with her world in completely new ways. So she can smell everything everything. <laughs> and she uses that to help interpret her environment. She's very sensitive to taste, and she likes to try new flavors that most four-year-olds avoid with their whole being. 
Um, she can see tiny airplanes far away in the sky with this laser sharp vision. And she can sense things. So she's very perceptive to body language. She notices tiny changes in her environment. She feels the smallest of vibrations. And she even knows when someone comes into the room behind her without turning around, um, not because she can hear them, but because she can sense that person's presence. Like the footfall on the floor and the slight air movement, and the feeling that someone is watching her and expecting her to respond. And I know that sounds like a creepy horror movie when somebody's <laughs> watching me, um, but it's part of her heightened vigilance. It's part of her way of interpreting her environment and using all of those context clues together. And because she has gotten so good at you know, noticing every little thing and using that to interpret her environment and her situation, she can react appropriately in a way that amazes me when I watch her. She's only four, but she has the perception of a fully grown adult because it's part of her compensation. It is part of her toolkit. And so as I watched my daughter continue to navigate through life's challenges, I realized that I was completely wrong about her missing out. She's not missing anything at all, actually. She's just experiencing life in such a different way than I ever will. I thought about being jealous of her a little at first because of the richness of experience that she would have that I never will have. And I watch her interact with her deaf friends at her hearing support preschool, and they kind of smile at each other back and forth like they have a secret to share. They speak to each other in their own little language. It's, it's English, and I understand what they're saying, but not in the way that they understand each other. And sometimes they communicate without speaking out loud at all. So I was recently at a party for the preschool, and I was watching the kids interact totally independently of the activities at the party. And they would exchange special looks and reach out and touch one another's shoulders. And even just their body movements in that moment were conveying their emotions to their classmates. And I realized as I watched them that they were having a full conversation. They were relating to each other. Each individual journey linked by that related tool of hearing loss. But Darcy also leverages her hearing loss in the hearing world. She goes to a mainstream preschool as well, where all of the children have full hearing. And I watch her explain the cochlear implants to them and the technology of how they work at their level in a way that even the teachers can't. Darcy has a connection to other people that I don't have and will never have because of her deafness. Is it a disability? Yes, but her disability is also a tool. It's a tool that she is using to connect with others that wouldn't be possible if she didn't have that tool. My daughter is deaf, but that's not all that she has to offer the world. She has a number of other tools that allow her to make amazing contributions to society. She's tremendously empathetic toward her toys, toward the cat, toward her brother even. Um, she's a fierce problem solver, creative. She doesn't give up when things don't work the first time. She's definitely a self-advocate, for good or for bad. <laughs> but all of that together is just part of her toolkit. And toolkits are not just about physical characteristics or personality traits. They're also about life circumstances and choices that you make. So D Darcy, at four years old, is not making a ton of independent choices yet, but you can guarantee that her life circumstances and everything that's happened so far is part of her toolkit. But this is not just my daughter. This is you. This is everyone. Have you ever been able to connect with someone without speaking out loud? Have you ever been able to perceive a situation totally differently than someone standing next to you in that same situation? Have you ever been able to be successful in an environment where you didn't really have what you needed? You did that because of your toolkit. Things that you might have thought life dealt to you unfairly are actually things that you can turn around to lead you to be successful. You have a different toolkit than my daughter's, but it is no less important. Because everyone on this earth has a unique toolkit that is necessary in that combination of all the different things that make up you to reach others. So yes, personality traits and physical characteristics, but also tools like ambitions, career choices, desires, income, relationships, approach to challenges, beauty or not in some cases, all of those things are equally valuable. It's not, it's not fair, 
but it's equally valuable in this world to make the contribution that you were meant to. Now keep in mind that in the purest form of this concept, there's no room for arrogance. So if you're super rich, let's say, that's not because you're more valuable than someone else. That's just because that super richness is a tool that allows you to communicate or connect with someone else who's super rich or for somebody who needs someone that's super rich to help them. I'm sure Bill Gates has a number of super rich friends that he can connect with that I can't because I'm not super rich. Now, on a side note, I'm sure we all wish that being super rich was part of our toolkit. I would sign up for that if that was an option, <laughs> definitely. Um, but if we all had that tool, that would negate the ability for us to relate personally to someone else using that tool. Same thing happens with intelligence, so another obvious example. So if you're super smart, it doesn't mean that you're more important than someone else. It just means that you have a tool to connect with other super smart people or to help someone who needs a super smart person to stand in the gap for them. Think about Stephen Hawking, who through crazy physical challenges was able to use his intelligence to contribute so much to society over decades of hardcore scientific work. But you know, money and intelligence are generally positively lauded as aspects of a toolkit. But one of the things that I find the most humbling and inspiring about a toolkit is that anything can be used as a tool. Even your negatives, your regrets, your mistakes, your bad habits, the characteristics you have that you wish you didn't, your embarrassing stories, all of that can be used as a tool. And in fact, instead of explaining away or dismissing or shrugging off things that you don't like about yourself, try and look for ways to intentionally use those as a tool to connect with someone else. That nail-biting habit you haven't been able to kick since middle school, someone else out there is struggling with that and could use your sympathy. That relationship that you walked away from and haven't stopped thinking about since, yeah, someone else in this world has that tool and they wish they didn't have it either. But together, you can learn to grow from that experience. So somewhere, someone in this world needs the exact toolkit that you have. They need you to connect with them with your unique combination of attributes and choices and life circumstances and all of the things that make you uniquely you. If you adopt the perspective that you're good, you're bad, and you're ugly are all necessary for you to contribute to society in the way that you were meant to, you can change the world. And if you routinely, intentionally approach yourself and others this way, even if you can't change the world, you can change your entire perspective on life. You can start looking at other people and look at their choices and attributes just as tools that make up their toolkit. And you can more deeply self-reflect on your own choices and attributes and circumstances and how those can be used as tools as well. What freedom comes in releasing yourself from judgment both yourself and others, and instead finding ways to position your unique circumstances to connect with other people. I want that world, and it's entirely possible. Today, it centers around the concept of a toolkit. Because no, life is not fair. And in fact, I've been asked before, many times actually, if I was angry or bitter that my daughter was broken or not normal or you know, had special needs, but I can honestly say that the answer is no, because she utilizes that tool of deafness to connect with other people that wouldn't be possible any other way. We were outside in the backyard a few weeks ago and she was like, mommy, mommy, look in the sky, there's a bird. And I'm like, what, what? You know, so I'm looking around and I don't see anything. And she continues to point and insist that there's this beautiful bird that's just outside my reach of vision. So I'm squinting in the sky in the sun, and I finally see the tiny black speck in the sky, and she's like, yeah, yeah, that's the bird. I would have missed it because my toolkit doesn't include laser-sharp vision, first of all, but also because her heightened, her heightened vigilance and her awareness of her environment allows her to truly appreciate the beauty around her. Your toolkit can do the same like no one else can. So your uniqueness, your positives and your negatives should be celebrated and then used to create the kindred that is the foundation of human experience. Thank you.